Hi, I'm Nick Schultz, the editor of American.com here at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm joined today by Pete Weiner. Pete, good to have you here. Thanks, great to be with you, Nick. Pete uh, is a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy That's Center right. here in Washington. Uh, prior to going to EPPC, you worked in the White House, the administration of George W. Bush, uh, both as a speechwriter and then also on various special projects. Right. Um, and then after getting out uh, from the Bush administration, you've you've actually had one of the more prolific years of uh, uh, of anybody I can think out there. You are co-author of not one but two books, right. and that's what you're here to talk to us about today. And, and we'll take them in turn. The first book uh, goes by the title "City of Man: Religion and Politics in a New Era." So, for those who who, who don't know, maybe just give us a little primer. What is "City of Man," and tell us why you chose that as a title and, and basically what the book is roughly about. Sure. Um, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, City of Man is a play off St. Augustine's great work, uh, City of God. And Augustine wrote uh, that uh, people who are believers, Christians, uh, are citizens of two cities. Um, the city of God, which is the city to come, and the city of man, and that we have obligations to both, but there are tensions uh, in uh, living in the city of man while being um, a citizen of the, of the city of God. And those tensions manifest themselves uh, in all sorts of ways in human life, uh, including in politics. And so Mike Gerson and I uh, decided uh, to write a book. Um, and, and Mike Gerson who was a, was a speechwriter in the White House. He's now a columnist for the Washington Post and, and a good friend of yours. That's right. right. In fact, I, I worked for Mike. Uh, Mike was the chief speechwriter to President Bush. And Mike hired me to be his deputy where I was for uh, two years before I became director of the Office of Strategic Initiatives. And Mike is one of my closest friends. Um, and uh, both he and I are people of faith, and uh, we've both written episodically on this issue, which is a perennial issue, uh, the relationship between um, religion and politics, in our case, between Christianity and politics. And we felt like that this is a kind of fluid moment uh, for evangelical Christians, uh, which is the perspective from which we write. We think that uh, a movement that w went by the name of the religious right, conservative evangelical Christians, that religious right movement is really coming to an end. Um, it's exhausted uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, it's, uh, its time has come and gone. And so how is that manifesting itself, that it's coming, to, that, that that iteration of it anyway? Is well, I think it's end. manifesting itself in several ways. I think in, the, in, in some ways the most obvious thing is that many of the leaders of the Christian right are either literally or figuratively passing from the scene. D. James Kennedy and Jerry Falwell um, have passed away. Pat Robertson, uh, Jim Dobson are older, stepping back. Uh, Dr. Dobson used to host Focus on the Family. He's no longer doing that. He has his own radio show, but it's a different one. So you, you've got a whole generation of leaders that really define the religious right who are, who are no longer there. And they haven't yet really been replaced. There aren't um, prominent individuals who have stepped up and taken their, their role. But I, really beyond that, I think some of the theology. And that's not what you're looking to do with the book, right? No, you're not looking no, to assert no. yourself as uh, No, I wouldn't. Uh, I would. it, it, instead, it's more of an, uh, of an, ana uh, an analysis of the religious right uh, as a political phenomenon, as a religious phenomenon. And you. Uh, have both criticism and praise for it. Right. Uh, is that right? Uh, That's right. I mean, we, we, we try to have a, a, a balance sheet on the religious right. You know, James Madison had, had a line uh, where he said that you should be a loving critic of your country. And I think Mike and I would uh, qualify as loving critics of the religious right because we're both conservative, we're both evangelical Christians. And we think that the religious right did a number of things that were good. We think that they helped the relationship between the evangelical world and the Catholic world, which for many years, many generations, was strained. And fortunately, they're not. I'm from that Catholic you, world that we're sitting here. We're not, sitting uh, here. Trading yeah. blows over it, the Pope. Uh, exactly. It, it's, yeah. it's Comity of instead that. of conflict. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's good to have. And really, the religious right was, was, was part of that uh, movement. Secondly, um, the religious right took evangelical Christians who for many decades had been withdrawn from politics and felt for a variety of reasons that they didn't have a place or shouldn't have a place in politics and re-engaged them. And I think that was uh, all to the good. Um, the religious right was also um, the most important political voice uh, for the uh, rights of the unborn. 
And in the aftermath of the Roe v. Wade decision in 1973, a lot of people um, declared, including the New York Times and an editorial, that the abortion decision was now over and settled. And there were millions of Americans of conscience who said, no, it's not. The court has decided, but that doesn't mean the issue is, is finally decided. And the, the religious right, I think, uh, deserves a lot of credit for that. On the other hand, um, Mike and I argue that the religious right did several things that, that uh, we think were counterproductive. Uh, one of it was a, was a tonal issue. There were certain things that were said, a kind of aggressiveness and an aggrieved tone that we think uh, was counterproductive, both politically and also theologically. What do you, that, to me, uh, that was some of the most interesting analysis of the book. What, what account, in your view, what accounts for that? What accounts for, I mean, to, you know, as you know, uh, having served uh, in government, tone is political, right? right? And so there, there could be a, a sense in which the tone that was adopted, uh, it, was, it, it was calculated to serve political ends, or maybe it was just uh, an unfortunate uh, choice right. or, or a reflection of the character of the movement or something. What, what accounted for the tone that emerged, and what was your... Your, what was your beef with it? Yeah, I think there are a couple of things uh, that explain why it emerged. Uh, some of it, quite frankly, was, I think, fundraising. Uh, there's language that's used for fundraising letters and for fundraising purposes where you have to speak in apocalyptic terms to try and get people's attention so they're willing to contribute. Um, I think that's on, a, on one side. And people who themselves were a part of the religious right, like Cal Thomas, um, have testified essentially to that. I think the other thing that happened, uh, and it's more understandable, is that politics draws people who are passionate. And that's not a bad thing. Um, a lot of people that are involved in politics, the reason you and I got involved in politics is because of their causes that we care about. And when you get involved in the political arena, uh, it can be intense. And you get a lot of back and forth, a lot of argumentation, uh, the temperature goes up, and it's quite easy to um, lose your bearings a little bit and uh, you know civility gets tossed out and uh, and your tone and your language becomes sharp edged serrated edges uh, and uh, I think it's a temptation that most of us struggle with I've struggled with it as well in the White House uh, and and since and so you need a kind of check on that but I think that what you had is people who who felt strongly and deeply about issues and sometimes I think their rhetoric got got a little bit ahead of themselves the, Mike and I uh, are concerned in, uh, in terms of the rhetoric and, and the tone and the disposition of the religious right is, is really several. One is we felt like it was, frankly, a bad testimony to, to faith. Um, and, uh, and also there was a sense that over time the religious right uh, became um, uh, subservient to an appendage of a political party, a political movement. And there we actually credit the Catholic Church as a much better model in a certain way. Now, the Catholic Church speaks out as a church institutionally on issues, but one doesn't get the sense that, that they're uh, you know, part of the Republican National Committee or anything. Mm -hmm. There's something about it that keeps sort of the integrity of the church. And I actually think, in looking back of the religious right over the 80s and 90s, it became too closely associated with political movements and political parties. Mike and I argue that um, when Christians get involved in politics, they ought to bring something distinctive or even rare, and that faith itself should stand in judgment of all political movements and all political ideologies. That doesn't mean that at particular moments in time, people of faith won't find themselves associating with a political party or a political movement more uh, one more than another. Mm -hmm. But it does mean that you need to be to uh, to be careful when you uh, when you do it. And we felt like. If you examine the history of the religious right, there were times, too many times, that too many lines were crossed. What, what accounted for that? I mean, the, the fact that uh, part of it had to do, I, th I think, just purely with the politics involved, or at least with some of the animating issues. I mean, you mentioned the, uh, the abortion issue. Right. Um, uh, but obviously that's an issue for, for many Catholics, uh, say, that, that would be uh, critical to them. And yet, with the Catholics, you see some are Republicans, uh, many are Democrats, independents, but what, what were the, the dynamics that led it to be the case that the re religious light be came to be, not, not in your view just uh, seemingly associated with, with the GOP too much, but in fact too much a part of it? Well, I think because a lot of the leaders of the religious right were themselves conservatives politically, mm -hmm. and so uh, they then began to 
associate themselves uh, not as political figures but as Christian leaders with a conservative agenda and that would be conservative on everything from um, taxes um, to welfare to treaties with Taiwan to abortion to a whole host of other things now I must say I'm sympathetic to most of those views I'm a conservative uh, and I would uh, align myself with the Republican Party on most most issues I just think that when you speak out Christian qua Christian as a person of faith you have to be careful when you're doing it and you especially need to be careful if you're beginning to make the argument that the right Christian position on X or Y issue uh, is, 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 uh, is such and such. I just think that that is uh, that's troubling. One of the arguments that Mike and I make in the book uh, is that um, the scriptures themselves, either the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament, it's not a, a, a political uh, manifesto. There isn't a discernible political philosophy out of it, and it's very dangerous to try and take the principles that are articulated in Scripture and then sort of simplistically connect the dots on a whole range of, of, of issues. Now, that requires a caveat because um, one of the great principles of Christianity uh, is justice. Uh, and uh, people of faith would argue that God cares about justice and he cares about human events. So that's not an argument that we ought not to be uh, involved in these issues or even decide on these issues. It's simply an argument that there are prudential judgments involved. And when there are prudential judgments involved, you have to be very careful about speaking as if, you know, uh, the views you have came on stone tablets. So the, uh, the, the book, uh, a part of it, it, it looks back at the recent political past, <coughs> uh, the, the rise and the influence of the, of the religious right, which you're saying is that iteration is passing from the scene. But a lot of the book is forward-looking. Right. And I want to talk just a little bit about mm -hmm. that before we move to your other sure. uh, book. Um, you write uh, in the book that a new generation of Christian evangelical leaders is, quote, less interested in resisting the predominant culture than in shaping it. What, it, what does that mean? And I'm wondering if that doesn't pose some potential um, challenges uh, uh, or even even threats, which we can talk, talk a little bit about. Well, what do you mean by that, that they want to shape the culture, not sort of stand athwart it, uh, trying to stop it altogether? Yeah, yeah, and there are issues that are, that are concerning. We, we can get, uh, get to that. I, I think essentially what, what Mike and I are, are arguing is that uh, f for, many for many years, um, members of the Christian right, I think, had a kind of siege mentality, an aggrieved mentality. Um, and a somewhat apocalyptic mentality. And they felt like uh, they were under attack. And it provoked in them a kind of response that I think was, was off-putting. Um, and if you speak to Christians now of the millennial generation in their, their 20s and 30s, um, a little bit older than that, I think that they, they were really turned off by that. They see that there are cultural problems. Um, but they also see areas of cultural renewal that are, that, are, that are going on. And I think that they feel like they can be a part of the process less as a kind of an aggrieved outsider and more as a sort of mature insider, if you will, uh, being able to articulate arguments on the merits uh, to promote the moral good and to try and shape culture in a way that, that advances human dignity and human flourishing. And uh, what would be some, some specific ways? I mean, if that if the approach is much more taking the, the culture within which evangelicals live, taking it as, a, as they are within it, but then trying to shape it, what would be some specific ways of trying to um, shape that culture that would differ, say, from the way the, the earlier generation of the religious right would have would have handled it. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is rhetorical and, and tonal. I think a lot of the mechanisms mm -hmm. that, that, are, that are available to us have existed for many years. Um, uh, there's voting, which, which obviously makes a difference. There's getting involved in organizations that, that, can, uh, that can make a difference. But I'll give you a good example of where I think there's been a shift um, in rhetoric that I think has had cultural um, consequences, um, two issues that I think illustrate that. One is on the pro-life issue. Um, for years, there was the kind of rhetoric that characterized the religious right as it related to abortion. 
was more in the realm of calling those with whom you disagree baby killers. Now that wasn't done by everybody, but there was that kind of slant to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was a language of sort of attack and, and almost demonizing one's opponents. What happened is uh, that thanks to the contribution of Catholics like Richard John Newhouse and George Weigel, the language shifted and um, the arguments on behalf of the pro-life cause was to enlarge the circle to protect the defenseless and the voiceless and to link the pro-life movement to the abolition movement, to the argument about um, protecting human life and human dignity. And I think that kind of rhetorical shift won people over who themselves may have been dispositionally pro-life but felt like the rhetoric was, was too heated. The same thing happened um, with welfare reform on a lesser scale, but I think it's still illustrative. Um, you know, for years the welfare critique was uh, welfare queens and uh, ridiculing or attacking the people on welfare. And I think what happened is that uh, in the uh, later 1980s and 1990s, um, conservatives and, um, and Christians began to talk about how welfare created dependency and was harming uh, human character and hurting the people that it was meant to help. And AEI's own Charles Murray was a huge figure in, in that when he wrote his book in the early 1980s called Losing Ground. I remember when I was a young guy at the time uh, and uh, I heard Charles uh, Murray speak and I was struck that this guy was not a kind of conservative caricature on the issue of welfare. This is a person who seemed really to care about what welfare was doing to the people it was meant to, to help. So I think that kind of thing, that kind of shift in rhetoric and thinking um, is, is important in cultural, um, cultural debates. One uh, final question about the, your first uh -huh. book, which has to do with sure. your government uh, experience. How did, how did working in government, um, uh, be, prior to going into government, you've been thinking about uh, public policy issues and, and governance from your uh, perspective as a, as a Christian, um, uh, but then you go into it, and it, right. it, it's, a, it's a different beast once you get inside it. How did that influence what ultimately came out in, in the book and you're thinking about these issues? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think it, it, it mostly reinforced certain impressions that I had. I don't think that I had uh, any uh, profound shifts in, in, in views. Before coming to the White House, I'd served in the Reagan and Bush um, 41 administration, so I'd, I'd had those experiences. But I think there are several things that government taught me that I think were relevant to, to our book and, and, and to my life experience. The first thing is that uh, it actually deepened my appreciation for the nobility of politics that the good that politics um, can do. Uh, I've never been cynical about uh, politics. I understand that there are uh, some, some reasons uh, that people can be cynical about it. There are people involved in politics who are not particularly noble uh, characters. Politics by its very nature involves compromise and so forth. On the other hand, politics in its deepest and best sense um, is about justice and, adv and advancing the human good. And when you're in government, there are certain opportunities you have on certain issues at certain moments where you can do that. Uh, and in the Bush administration, the Bush White House, uh, one um, example of that was the Global AIDS Initiative, uh, where um, President Bush, for no political reasons, um, pushed uh, the uh, initiative that was the l largest contribution by far for a single disease in history. And a recent study came out and said that PEPFAR, which is the, the acronym for the Global AIDS Initiative, was responsible for saving uh, more than a million lives in Africa. That's, that's really good. Um, there are other issues, crime and welfare, where we saw public policy could take problems that were difficult, some people thought were intractable, and turn them around. I would argue with Afghanistan and Iraq, for all of the problems that, they, uh, that, they, uh, that were attended them, and the mistakes that we made, and I'm happy to go into. Nevertheless, um, America was able to liberate more than 50 million people from two of the most sadistic and brutal regimes in human history. And that was a good thing. Uh, now, uh, that doesn't mean that both Iraq and Afghanistan uh, 
you know, have conditions like uh, Sweden or, uh, or, or Switzerland, they're a long way from that, and there are real struggles there. And as I said, we made mistakes. But um, a lot of people were liberated uh, from uh, really um, malevolent leaders in very, very difficult conditions. And I'm actually proud um, of that. So there were a whole series of issues, and others, just the other ones that I mentioned, where you can see that politics done the right way can really do um, good. That uh, was, was one thing. Second thing is that you, know, you face temptations um, in, in politics uh, in terms of the civility issue that we've been talking about. Uh, I'm a person who not only worked for President Bush, but I respect him, and I have deep uh, personal affection for him. He's somebody that, that I, I like a great deal. And he was on the receiving end of what I think were uh, uh, at times ad hominem and vicious personal attacks, unfair attacks. He was called a moral coward and a liar and a loser uh, by leading members of the Democratic Party. Now, when you're in the White House, uh, you need to respond to that. And I'm a person by temperament and disposition, as you know, because we used to work together, who responds uh, when, when under attack. And, um, and I think that's good, and I don't think that there's an argument scripturally, uh, biblically, that Christians shouldn't respond. Um, but there's a temptation to cross lines, and you have to have people in your life, in your professional life, in your personal life, who are there uh, you know, to be able to keep you grounded and to keep you from, from doing that. Um, the third thing, uh, I'm not sure how relevant it is to the book, but it, it was something that really struck me uh, during my time in the White House, which is just the quality of the people that I worked with. I'd read a lot of memoirs, as you can imagine, um, White House memoirs, people who had worked in various administrations. And usually in a White House, there's a lot of palace intrigue, a lot of backbiting, a lot of power maneuvers and so forth. And I experienced almost none of that. And uh, the people I worked with, uh, some were extremely impressive, some less impressive. But almost to a person, they were good people who were involved for the right uh, reasons. And, uh, and I was really struck by, uh, by that. It was, a, it was a place where there was um, good spirit and you know, people were, were by and large uh, you know, working on the, uh, in the, pulling in the same direction and trying to advance the same things. And, uh, and that was an encouraging thing. You mentioned this is a good uh, time to pivot because you mentioned the, the nobility of politics and the pursuit uh, through politics of, of justice. And uh, the, the second book that you co-authored this year, um, which is co-authored with AEI President Arthur Brooks, uh, goes by the title Wealth and Justice, The Morality of Democratic Capitalism. Now, this book arrives at an interesting time because there um, uh, would be, for some people, I think, something of a crisis of democratic capitalism. We've had this a very, by all accounts, bitter, bitter recession, uh, a nasty financial crisis uh, that uh, people are still arguing about, uh, the causes uh, of it. And um, uh, I wouldn't say there's a clear end in sight to the problems that the country is ha having. This is the United States, the home of democratic capitalism. Right. So you're making a full-throated case, uh, not right. just for capitalism, but for its morality. Right. Um, why? Well, um, because we think it merits it. Uh, Arthur is a, is a terrific and brilliant guy, and it was a joy to work with him on this book. Uh, Arthur and I uh, argue that of all the economic systems uh, in human history, uh, capitalism is far and away the best by almost any criteria that you want, in terms of the wealth that it creates, in terms of uh, the advancements that it allows in medicine and technology, uh, and in terms of lifting people out of misery and, and poverty. Uh, and uh, I believe, and I think Arthur believes, that not enough people actually make a moral defense of, of capitalism. Economics is sometimes, uh, I think, reduced to arguments about numbers. Uh, and about growth figures and unemployment rates. Now, those things and matter. So, and some would say that's enough, right? You could say if you look at human history, you look at what capitalism has, has done compared with other economic models, it is delivered on just basic economic grounds, uh, whether it's per capita GDP or what have you. But you think that's not a not enough, not enough of a justification. Why? No, I think, I think it's, uh, it's important, but I don't think it's, the, uh, it's the, the full story. There's a lot to be said about economic growth because it leads to um, 
to, to human uh, advancement and human happiness, and that, that matters um, a lot. But there's also an argument to be made that capitalism uh, can uh, reinforce certain qualities and characters that are important to the citizenry. Uh, entrepreneurship, uh, responsibility, self-reliance, energy, uh, those kinds of, of things. Now, there's an argument Daniel Bell famously made of cultural contradictions of capitalism. Mm -hmm. that capitalism can hurt human character. It can exacerbate acquisitiveness. Greed, greed, greed is good, right? Gr greed right. is good, uh, <laughs> to, to quote uh, uh, the uh, movie Wall Street from the 1980s. Um, and look, there's an argument for that too. Uh, but Arthur and I are careful in the book to make the point that capitalism alone isn't enough. That capitalism relies on character forming institutions, civic associations, families, schools, and so forth, to create the kind of character so that you have people who, when they engage in capitalistic enterprises, free enterprise, that they conduct themselves in a way. That is, uh, that, is, that is relatively uh, moral. Capitalism can, can fail, but uh, the failures that, that one can cite, the, the most prominent ones, are because of failures by human beings, by capitalists themselves. Um, and you know, one needs to be careful not to claim that, that capitalism does everything. It's an economic system. It's not a moral system. Um, and it does require other things. But for what you want an economic system to do, uh, there is nothing uh, in the history of, of humankind to, uh, to compete with it. The, you mentioned the other uh, institutions upon which it must rely, uh, mm -hmm. community, family. Um, there is the, uh, an argument, which are familiar to you, that part of the problem with capitalism is that it undermines those exact um, institutions, that the dynamic nature of it undermines communities by people having to change jobs and move out of them quickly, or that puts pressures on families so that uh, two parents have to work as opposed to one now, or um, you, I know you're familiar with it. What, right. what do you make of that? Are those arguments wrong? Are they missing part of the story? What's the, are they incomplete? Yeah, I think probably incomplete. I mean, I, th there is something to that. I mean, capitalism, a thriving economy, does cause churning, and it causes uh, people to move, uh, and therefore communities sometimes to, to have less less uh, roots. But I think that that can be exaggerated. And of course, people who work in the military are the families that move most of all. And we know in our own lives that you know we've gotten very very strong relationships with families, military families, people that move, they leave. You're sad about that. You stay in touch with them. Other people uh, other people come in, uh, but. I'm not arguing, and neither is Arthur, is that there isn't a kind of collateral uh, damage or collateral effects to capitalism. The point is you have to take things in the totality of their, of their acts and to try and mitigate uh, some of the, 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 the more harmful effects that these things can, uh, can have. But I don't think capitalism, per se, is, is causing, um, for example, you mentioned uh, parents, two parents in the workforce instead of uh, a uh, you know a mother staying home with um, with young children or a father staying home or a father staying home <laughs> with, with uh, young children fair enough but I think the numbers are still probably overwhelmingly that, that the mother would uh, but in either case that's a decision that individuals and individual families have to make but uh, capitalism is not driving people to do that and indeed if you go by the argument which we make which is that capitalism creates wealth. It, it actually allows people to get more time with their families and, and would hopefully argue that you wouldn't have to have two parents. I mean, we're, we're both familiar with stories of generations ago of people saying, look, my dad had two or three jobs. He was hardly ever home because he had to work two or three jobs to be able to pay the bills. And fortunately, that kind of situation, while it still exists, is less than it used to be. And so you have situations where uh, fathers and mothers really have actually more time to spend with their, um, with their family and their kids than, than previous generations. And you could argue that that's in part because of the prosperity created by capitalism. The, uh, I'm interested in, in the title of the, of the book because I think it's very deliberate, and I wanna, I will, but I want to press you on it. Um, you talked about wealth, obviously, mm -hmm. right now. The title is Wealth and Justice. Um, 
And I think that's, if you, if you were to ask some critics of, of capitalism, um, they might say that the, there's a little bit of an incompatibility there. Insofar as capitalism's, it may be a great engine of wealth creation, but in the same process, it creates inequalities and rifts between people, and there's a fundamental injustice there. Right. How do you respond to that? Well, I think that argument is wrong. I mean, justice means that people get their just due, what they what they are what they what they deserve, and uh, I think a lot of the critics on the left, uh, including the Christian left, people like Jim Wallace and so forth, uh, they argue for income redistribution that that is somehow more just that equality of outcome is is more just than equality of opportunity. Uh, that's not the meaning of justice. Uh, that's not even the American way if you interpret the American uh, experiment and the American dream um, as people like Abraham Lincoln did. Um, what Lincoln argued is that um, people uh, should uh, be given equal opportunity. That is, they need to have the social capital, the conditions in life to allow them to succeed, education and so forth. But they should be allowed to succeed to wherever they can do it. Human life itself is built with inequalities in all sorts of ways. Some people are better singers than others. Some are better athletes than others. Some are more intelligent in math. Others are better writers. And if you um, take the justice argument and you try and have this leveling effect, especially if you use government as the instrument to try and do this leveling effect, it has pernicious outcomes. And in addition, um, as uh, Arthur and I point out in, in the monograph, um, that the uh, uh, gap in inequality is actually not uh, 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 less in non-capitalist countries than, uh, than, in, uh, than in other ones. Uh, what you want to do, to use a little line, is you know, a rising tide lifts all, uh, all boats. And uh, as those boats rise, they're going to rise to, 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 uh, to different points. Now, that doesn't mean that, uh, for example, a progressive income tax isn't, the wi isn't a wise thing to do. But that's really much more in the order of from whom much is given, much is, much is required. I think that's in an entirely different category from those who argue that redistribution ought to be the, uh, the end of government. We use an example uh, in, in the, the book that was given to us by a professor. Um, which is, I think, a powerful one, and it illustrates the point. And this professor says that at the beginning of every semester, he uh, tells students, and when they're given their first class, he, he, he does this, or he says he does it, which is that he is going to take uh, points off of the um, tests of the people who did well and give them to points to the people who didn't do well in order to equalize the results. And everybody... <laughs> both the, the high achieving students and the lower achieving students understand that that's not fair. Now the lower ones are happy to receive the extra points, but they all understand that the people who do well on the test ought to be rewarded for it. And you shouldn't take points away from them you know, to give to somebody else. Why? Because they have an instinctive sense that that's what? Unjust. Mm -hmm. Now that can apply to economics you know, as, as well. Now again, that isn't an argument uh, for specific tax policy or, or, or even to say um, there's a category of justice and then there's the, the category of compassion, which is, look, for people who, who, who uh, are on the lower end of the income ladder or who are poor, they're going to need additional help. And so we need to figure out ways in which to help them. And that might be through the tax code, though in general I don't think that the tax code should be used in that kind of manner. It, it ought to be used through government programs so you're able to, to, to measure and judge, uh, judge those, those uh, things. But this is again an issue where I think conservatives in general um, pull away too often from engaging in this debate about justice and in a sense cede the ground mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, to, to justice. People like Jim Wallace, uh, who I know Arthur debated recently at Wheaton College, um, argue as if they have the moral high ground uh, on this issue of, of capitalism, and they don't. And if you play out the real world effects, the human effects of what they argue for, um, they have a lot to answer for. Two more uh, questions for you, and then, then we're going we're gonna to be out of time. But I, 
you mentioned uh, in the context of your of, of the other book, City of Man, that um, uh, when you talk to uh, millennials and a rising generation of evangelicals, uh, that they look at politics a little differently. You talked about the importance of tone in politics. Uh -huh. When you talk uh, with evangelicals, young, younger evangelicals, about capitalism, about markets, free market, free enterprise, what is what's your sense of the attitude about that today? Is it is it to maybe an early generation, you know, the, the religious right uh, who's pretty reliable supporter of uh, markets and capitalism? Is it uh, a different take? Is there a skepticism about it, or is there the same sort of embrace of it? What's how does it break down? It's mixed. I think it's mixed, but uh, I think that there is um, there's a tendency among uh, younger evangelical Christians uh, to be um, critical toward toward the free market and to be drawn to the arguments of some people on the religious left uh, who argue that either capitalism is itself uh, unjust uh, or that the income inequality that exists um, has to be overcome. Uh, by the kind of leveling effects of of, uh, of government, and so I think a lot of these arguments, you know, need to be reinforced. The arguments that uh, favor capitalism on moral grounds, um, because a lot of younger people are driven by sort of moral considerations. There's an idealism uh, in in a lot of younger younger people, and uh, I think it's a mistake to seed yeah, the, uh, the idealism because I think in the end the arguments really are more on, on, uh, on our side than it is on the other side. A final question for you which has to do with, um, uh, with the subtitle of the book which is the, the morality of democratic capitalism. Now there's another, there are other uh, uh, competitive economic models out there. The one I have in mind um, that gets the most attention now is what might be called state capitalism or authoritarian capitalism, China being a very good example of this. Um, it's in many ways doing a lot of the things that advocates of capitalism, the defenders of capitalism, uh, <coughs> point to capitalism and say, well, look what it does. It, it raises living standards. It enables people to have more goods and services. Um, and yet it's doing it with a very different, fundamentally different model. Um, do you see the Chinese model, even though it is able to uh, uh, raise living standards and give people some of the material uh, benefits that they want. A moral equivalent or, or not, and, and why not? If it's able to produce the goods, why is, it, why is that insufficient? Well, it is producing the goods, but I, I think what's happening is actually, um, what it, it confirms what's a fairly traditional argument, which is that free markets lead to free societies. Now, that doesn't happen in the blink of an eye. These things go through transitions. But I think it's fair to say that if you chart uh, both um, China's relationship with capitalism and its uh, political openness that you would find that they correspond, which is the more capitalist it's becoming, the less totalitarian it, it is. China today certainly is, is nothing like what China was like under Mao during the Cultural Revolution and, uh, and so forth. And if you talk to people from China themselves, they will talk about how different China is as a political society. I don't think that evolution is complete, and I think that as time goes on, there's some hope that capitalism, by its very nature, will um, will create a more open uh, society. Uh, and Michael Novak uh, has argued uh, as eloquently as anyone ever has about the uh, how free markets and free societies not only coexist, but there's a kind of synergy uh, between them, and um, and a view of government and the limits of government that. Um, that apply both um, to an economic system and, uh, and to a political system. Uh, what you found throughout much of human history is that um, free societies tend to be capitalist societies and capitalist societies tend to be uh, free societies. And it's, you just don't find many, if any, examples of uh, you know, genuinely free market capitalist societies. Uh, that are authoritarian, certainly not totalitarian. And uh, I suspect over time, uh, when we have this conversation, you know, 50 years from now, when we take a look at, at China, I think that if China continues on its path uh, in terms of being amenable to capitalism, it will be politically uh, a much more open society, even than it is today. Well, I hope you're right. 
My uh, guest today is Pete Weiner. He's the co-author of two fascinating new books. Uh, one which is co-authored with uh, Mike Gerson called City of Man, Religion and Politics in a New Era. And the second book co-authored with Arthur Brooks called Wealth and Justice, Morality of Democratic Capitalism. Pete, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. I enjoyed it, Nick.